Welcome to the Backyard Professor Chess Videos. I'm at the end of a very long work day and I'm really tired. I probably should wait for another time to make these videos, but again, I'm focusing because I've got a tournament here in a couple weekends. And I'm really trying to share what I'm learning with you as a review for me as well as an enjoyable video of great chess instruction for you. Jeremy Silman, Reassess Your Chess, 3rd edition, once again. He's discussing the idea of temporary imbalances, and he shows one of his games. He's the black pieces. His opponent, Poopalls, is the white pieces. And they do a typical queen pawn opening. See, I'm already blowing up. E6, knight, c3. You can see it's a typical queen pawn opening, right? And he brings the bishop up to put the question to the knight immediately. Queen comes over here to bishop 3. Man, my board's wiggling tonight. He's going to support his bishop, although there is some center action here, and that pawn does take that pawn there. So the bishop stands all alone at this point, right? So what do you do in this kind of a situation? It's obvious that there's more play right now on the queen side. Well, he develops on the queen side, bringing the knight out, supporting the bishop. Nice move, right? Knight comes out to f3. Knight comes down to e4. He's already bringing, he's trying to attempt a central thrust on this, which is real interesting. Bishop uh, Poopalls is developing really well, and now Silman presents the first major imbalance of the game. He goes ahead and takes his bishop. This gives Silman the bishop pair, right? This is all an imbalance is, is an indifference. Don't worry about a plan so much as trying to play with imbalances. They will present, more or less, what to do, right? And he explains this beautifully in this. He has the two bishops, his opponent has the two knights. So he has deliberately made an imbalance here. Now, once you see this kind of imbalance between the minor pieces, as Silman says, I now want to try to create a pawn structure that inactivates white's knights. Right? He wants his bishops and knight to be stronger than his opponent's knights and single bishop. As it is, his bishop isn't going to go anywhere right now, right? So he's using the Steinitz rule here, and he wants to make his bishops strong. So now, you see, because he created this imbalance, he already has a plan. Now it's up to each individual's creativity, right, to produce the board situation that gives him a better board for bishops and he wants to take away the knight's influence. How does he do this? You see, he's not technically creating a plan and yet he is. He's saying he doesn't have a specific plan for each and every single piece, but right now he says the f5 is going to be his next move. Why? He has the two bishops. His bad bishop is bad at this point. He's going to live with that. What he's trying to do is inactivate the knights. The knight cannot go here, and this knight cannot go here. So by pressing the f5, he's controlling the d4, and he also wants to control the d5. So e4 and d5, the central squares for the knights he wants to control. Do you see how just simply having that one imbalance gives him a strategy? That's cool to see, right? Okay, I'm, and I'm going to explain this out in detail because it's such great instruction material. It really is. Now, he goes g3. Well, he's going to fee and keto his bishop, obviously, right? Bishop takes the pawn 
at c5. He didn't exchange the knights because Silman's trump, he says, is going to be his bishops. So he doesn't want to swap the knights. He's going to limit the activity of these knights. And what's going to happen, keep your fingers crossed, is they're going to get in each other's way here. He's cramping him, so to speak, is what he's attempting to do here. Bishop took c5. Bishop comes up here to g2. Long, beautiful diagonal here. b6. He's going to give support to his bishop. His opponent castles. Properly so. It's time to castle. You don't want to leave your king too far out. Now notice what Silman does here. This is fantastic. This is worth taking a moment and looking at. It's his bad bishop. Agree. Pride. It, it sucks. But he's getting it outside of the pawn chain. He's directly challenging this g2 bishop for that diagonal. He's not going to let his bishop grab the diagonal. His other bishop is also doing beautiful work heading toward the king and keeping somewhat notice on the queen side. His pawn structure, his great central pawn structure controls squares that the knights want to get to. Because he created the imbalance, now he has made the board fit his imbalance. It's that simple. And this isn't the only way to do it, but this is one way to do it. I want to teach you the principle, not the specific moves on how to do it, because each game is different, right? Now watch what white does. White comes up. E4, direct confrontation here. And you can expect your opponents to do this, of course. Now, at this point, it's a critical moment in the game. White recognizes that his knights do not have good central squares to go to, so he's going to fight Silman for those squares. Expect your opponent to do this. He's not going to let Silman mow him over, right? The cool thing is, he says, if he castles, and then this pawn takes f5, then white is going to acquire either e4 or d5. Right? You can see that. So the question Silman puts before himself, instead of castling at this point and allowing white to go ahead with his plan of getting rid of some of this central influence so that white can take control of a square, what does Silman do? Silman says you don't have to let your opponent present his plan to you and carry it out. No. Silman says a good refutation is to pop that pawn right down there to f4. Now watch the effect of this. I really think this is quite interesting. Black wants control, and he refuses to allow white to have his plans. He's made the effort to create the imbalance of bishops versus knights. He's made the effort to take away the squares for the knights. He wants those knights as inactive as possible of his opponent. Why let him free up his knights? There's no point to that. He says, no, I'm going to push the pawn. What this does, very interestingly, is g takes f4. Now do you see the effect on the board? Do you see what effect that pawn push had? He might have temporarily lost control of the e4. In the process, he weakened the king side by this pawn going here, this is a weak square, that, and this is a weak square. The bishop, true, is guarding it at this point, but you've got to understand he's not guarding it singly. I mean, there's going to be a confrontation. 
the area around the king is slightly weakened. Plus, what else do you notice? This is the beauty of learning how to read the chessboard. Sincerely. Honest. What's this? That is a partial open file, right? Well, you know Silman's going to castle soon. That's going to put his rook on an open file toward White's king. So, by pushing his f-pawn, he weakens the king side somewhat for White, and he strengthens his option to attack the king side. Because realize, boy, once this knight moves somewhere, we have a screaming battle going on with these bishops on that diagonal toward the king's side, don't we? Very important to keep in mind for the future. Knight comes to d4, challenging the queen. You can see how he's already beginning to utilize the weaknesses in the, in the uh, field, right? Queen drops down to d1, and here we go. Now he castles. Hot dog. Partial open file. A very weak pawn here has no protection as of yet. He can pluck it any time he wants to, right? See that? Now, since he castled, the pawn comes up to f5. See, you can see his opponent. He is seriously trying to gain squares here, here. He is pushing his pawns to gain squares for his knights. This is what the battle is about, the imbalances. Silman, on the other hand, wants to make sure things stay open for that powerful bishop and this powerful bishop. Very interesting to see the philosophy of the imbalances working here. It's very, very well illustrated here. Now, seeing that the f4 pawn was going to fall, white sells it for a dear price, of course. And he makes black give up one of his precious squares. But now watch what black can do. Queen h4. Wow, what a move. Well, we know Silman's intention on these, right? He's going to play for the attack, he says. Now, if this pawn takes this pawn, and this pawn takes this pawn, what we have here, he says, is... Black retains control, or white retains control over the d5, though black is challenging. And what else this does is it really does open up the file for the rook. So it's okay if white exchanges those pawns, as far as Silman's concerned. He doesn't mind that at all. It's a great fight for the center, and it's going to be in Silman's favor. Now, he says, knight comes up to f3, challenging the queen, forking his other knight. Well, the knight's going to take f3 and go check. And queen takes f3. And e takes f5. The pawn has been regained. And now look at the board. Remember, the board evolves throughout the game, right? He has deliberately set this up so that he limits the knights and strengthens his bishops. And look at what we have. A fabulous bishop diagonal pinning that pawn, which is attacked and attacked here, all the way down. The queen's right behind it. That's not good for white. So he's directly challenging because the king side has been weakened and his black bishop here is coming in. That's a very strong challenge with the bishops. He's got the queen on this side coming this way, down this way, and over this way to this pawn. Right? You can see that? That's a pretty tough setup right now. So more or less, Silman's happy with his position, and White is probably not as comfortable as he wants to be. Right? Knight comes to d5, he says, and he puts a question mark here. Now, quite frankly, though, it's a great outpost, yes. You can see that. I mean, wow. Two sensational pawn outposts, and it does limit the influence of that bishop. That almost makes sense, except for one problem. Now, 
Silman can continue taking the initiative by swapping the pawn and opening the file himself. Here, the pawn is safe. The queen's got it covered. So Silman is slowly improving his position through the use of the imbalances of favoring the two bishops, making it so that the two bishops have the more power than the knight. He's already gotten rid of one of the knights. Well, the queen does take the e4, right? And now Silman says, okay, here's what we're going to do. Here's what we're going to do. It's not a full-fledged kingside attack yet. Bishop is going to take f2. Check. Right? And he says he wins the pawn because, of course, the king has to move out of check. And now, Silman takes the queen. Queen takes e4. And here's his note. He says, by going into an endgame now at this point, Black gives up on the initiative for a short while. Instead, he concentrates on consolidating the advantages that he's gained. So he's going to show us what that is. This is the kind of instruction I love to help us learn about the whole game of chess, beginning, middle, and end, right? This illustrates a rule set forth in the earlier part of his book, and this is a critical rule. At this point, when you win material, stop rushing forward. Instead, tighten everything up, defend your weak points, get your army to work together again, and only then start a final assault. He's not as organized as he would like to be, to continue attacking. So it's time to stop for a while, for just a few minutes. The first order of business is to ensure the safety of his main trump. And what is that trump? I've been talking about it the whole game. His two bishops. He wants to make sure these bishops stay on the board because that's his power imbalance. That makes perfect sense. It addresses the imbalance, and it keeps the extra power on his side. He says the extra pawn will not be activated for a long time. So, bishop, the white bishop, takes the queen, e4. Great centralization of forces, right? So the queens are off the board. Now it's time to back up, regroup, but keep your favorable imbalance. In Silman's case, it's the bishops. He moves the king to h8, and b comes to 3 to strengthen the outpost of the knight. That's a beautiful knight. You've got to admit, it's a, it's a heck of a central oomph by his opponent, isn't it? There's nothing wrong with this. That, that's good That's good chess. Rook A comes to E8. He is going to grab the other central file. He has a central file. He's going to grab the other central file, hitting the piece that's unprotected, so he's virtually forcing this piece to move back. Right? Now watch what he does. Ta-da! Have I not said this a billion times? Rooks on open files, and then jump right up there to either the 7th or the 2nd rank. What does Silman show us? Proper rook strategy. You see how he's beginning to coordinate his army again, and at the same time, he is making every piece of his better than his opponent's. His bishop is obviously superior to his, his opponent's bishop. His rook is obviously superior to either one of his opponent's rooks. Granted, the knight reigns supreme, but that's only one minor piece. Silman has three major pieces. Well, two majors and a minor, but they're in a great position. This is great chess. It's fun to see how it works together. I love how he does this. Now, with everything safe again, he says Black once again tries to seize control of the game. And now A4, he's going to try to get more queenside space. Absolutely, can't blame him. 
A5, someone's going to put a squelch to that immediately. That way he doesn't have any counterplay. Why? Because on this side of the board, it's easy to see, there's no guesswork here, white is superior. That makes perfect sense, right? So, stop his counterplay. You don't have to let him play on that side for free. Not on your life. Rook A to D1. Now he's trying to grab a central file. See, they're playing great chess. G6. Again, limiting squares. Bringing up squares for a possible outpost of his bishops and trying to limit squares of the knights. And it ends any back rank mate check pro checkmate problems that can come up because there are so many central files. <laughs> yeah. Again, easily, beautifully logical and sensible. I love how he talks this way. Truly. Rook b3. Rook b2. Rook comes over to b2. What's he doing? Hitting his weakness. The target. Right? The backward pawn. It's backward because it cannot advance safely. It will be attacked. Therefore, it's a backward pawn. And it's a weakness, and so go after the weakness. The combination of the rook on the seventh rank, and this is what else I wanted to show you in this video. It's so beautiful. He shows you how to combine the pieces in a coordination. This combination of the rook on the seventh rank and the two bishops on an open board. There's no central pawns here. It's all to the side. This kind of a combination is a beautiful thing to behold. It leaves white tied up and helpless. Watch how he pulls this together. Fantastic. Rook F to D1. Now, Okay, he's not mamby pamby around with the files. He's doubled on the file. This is Silman's weakness, right? Silman's not crowing that he doesn't have any weaknesses. He is saying, I have some imbalances that I want to emphasize and I want to make better, and so I'm going to focus on making them better. That's not, that doesn't mean his opponent's not going to do anything. They're playing good chess. I, I'm, I'm serious. This is really fun to see. Bishop now comes to c5. He pops the bishop on the outpost. He's got the diagonal. He's got the king in a corner. There's only one square he can run to, and he's got that covered, right? You remember what I said in our, uh, our uh, tactics, our practical tacticals. All he has to do is find a way to check that king, and that means checkmate. So... Keep your eye peeled on that. I'm talking too much, aren't I? I? I don't mean to. I just want to make sure we understand that we see this process. It's really quite cool how he does it. Rook comes back to F1 challenging the rook. The rook accepts the challenge. The bishop swaps the rook. Okay, so they've swapped a rook. Now, king comes up to G7, beginning to centralize the king because we need all of the army in the game. Always, always, don't neglect your kings. Bishop h3, screaming diagonal, hitting the weakness. Great chess. Got a target. Go for it. Bishop c6. He's lining up targets here, getting ready. <laughs> it's, it's coming. Things are going to break out here shortly. Oh, let's see, where'd I go? Bishop a3, bishop, bishop g4. Brings his bishop out, h5. He's going to chase the bishop away, gain himself more space on the king's side. Bishop down to d1, giving support to his weakness. You notice how they're trying to coordinate their rooks, their bishops, their knights, their rooks, their bishops, their pawns. This is a great way to, to watch this unfold. D6. He eliminates his weakness from the white squared bishop and he supports the strength of his dark squared bishop. This is outstanding. Bishop comes up to f3 again. Now that he sees it's going to be almost inevitable that he's never going to get this 
Bishop d7, he's coming out toward the king. Now the other bishop rears its ugly head. I mean, the, and, and we've got that, ay, ay, ay. They're looking pretty tough, isn't it? Knight e3, let's go to knight e3. He drops the knight down. And bishop h3. Now he brings his bishop to h3, closing this corner off, not letting his bishop have any kind of a control. Now the king is in jeopardy. Notice how each of black's pieces is superior to its white's counterparts. He emphasizes this many times with many illustrations in many games. This is how the masters, international masters and grandmasters play chess. They always strive to make every one of their pieces superior to their counterparts. The king is closer to the center than his. The bishops are obviously in a much stronger position than his bishop. His knight has now come down. His rook dominates the second rank. His rook is playing a defensive role. This is winning chess. This is how you do it. This is one way we can do it. Very important. Knight to d1. Dropping the knight, challenging the rook. Rook comes to b1 and pins the knight... Remember, you pin a piece, then if you can attack that piece, you can win that piece. Very interesting, huh? White is paralyzed and decides to shed another pawn for a bit of freedom. Rook d2. Drops his rook down. Rook takes b3. He gave him the pawn. He's trying to build more room. Bishop e4. Rook a3. And now his pawn structure collapses. He's got too much power here. Knight to b2. He's not going to give up without a fight, however. Rook a1 check. Rook d1 uncheck and challenge. Rook takes d1. Knight takes d1. Now the rooks are gone and the bishops reign supreme because it's an open board. You notice how he has kept his powerful positive imbalance throughout the course of this game. This is great illustration of how to do this. This is so cool. Black has retained the initiative from the opening to the end game by utilizing the imbalances he created at the beginning of the game. Now, White's Knight is trapped by a very dominant dark squared bishop. The knight can't move. There or there. Well, he can there, but he's trapped from going to this side. So, bishop comes down to f3. King comes up to f6, centralizing his king even further. Bishop goes over to e2. King comes up to e5. He's absolutely in the center, dominating. Now black has three powers working together in coordinated fashion. White only has two, and they're not really very coordinated, are they? Bishop f3. You notice the bishop's just kind of going in circles. He's doing absolutely nothing. In the meantime, Silman is marching his king forward. He's going to win the game, and now he brings his pawn more forward. Bishop back to e2. Bishop's absolutely doing nothing. And now king comes to f4. You notice the king is coming right into the thick of the battle. Bishop to d3. Bishop to g4. And now he's closed out the bishop and the knight from helping defend the king. I love how he does this. This is sensational. He's threatening mate and the knight h3, tries to get a little bit of breathing room, and by now it's way too late. Bishop takes d1, and white resigned, because you're never going to win being a power down than him, two bishops, and a king. This is a fantastic illustration. I love, again, you know, Silman has such a cool way of explaining things, you really ought to grab his stuff and, uh, look at it. So I hope this is instructive for you. I love reviewing this kind of stuff because I'm getting ready for my tournament next weekend. Not this weekend, but the next weekend. And so it'll be fun to have all this stuff fresh in my brain. I may as well make videos for your guys' benefit. So thanks for watching my videos. Happy chessercising, happy checkmating, happy studying.
and I'll see you in the next video.